So the first thing I want to talk about today, actually most of what we'll talk about today is changing the language. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is adding and as a special form to our language. And then the problem set you guys will get to add or as a special form to our language. Um, and then we'll talk about making the change where we're going to take lambda, which I always misspell, to make procedure, which I won't misspell. So we'll talk about how we could change language so I wouldn't misspell lambda all the time. And then we'll talk about making a different type of call, an, uh, basically a different type of compound expression in our language. That's what we're going to do today. So the first thing we're going to do is add and, which we'll call ADU and. So just to recall from scheme, if we have and, expression 1, expression 2, up through expression n, and is a special form that's going to evaluate these expressions in order, one at a time, from left to right. And what does it do? It's going to evaluate all the and clauses. What if it finds a false one? Does it evaluate all the clauses? No. So we could have a case in which you know, expression n is some infinite loop, but because an earlier expression was false, we'll never hit that. So and is our special form that we're going to use. And we have to write this into our system. We have to write it as a special form. We don't want to just evaluate all of these expressions. We want to evaluate them in order. So we're going to add a line to MC eval. And I'm going to put it after the if question mark line. And that line I'm going to add is going to read and question mark expression eval and expression in the environment. You'll see that for all of the special forms that we're implementing, we're going to write a procedure. There's an eval if, there's um, eval many of them. Eval define, various things like that. Let's see, here we go. We have eval if, eval and, which is added, eval assignment, eval definition. So for the special forms, we have to have special procedures to actually control the evaluation order that we're going to be putting in. So we need to write and question mark. How would we define and question mark of an expression? Does anybody remember what form or what, what uh, check we're going to use? That we have something called tagged list, which takes an expression and then the tag. So we can use that here for our and. We can say tagged list expression. <laughs> And we're going to use ADU colon AND. Because remember, if we were evaluating ADU AND, ADU equals 1, 2, ADU greater than 2, 3, this is the same as a list structure like this. First is ADU and. This is the list ADU equal 1, 2, and this is the list of ADU greater than 2, 3. So what tagged list does is it checks to see if the car of the expression is EQ to the tag. In this case, our tag, what we're using as our operator, but we can think of as a tag for our expression, is ADU colon AND. I'd also like to write a procedure called 
and clauses, which will take an expression and is going to return a list of the clauses that I need to evaluate in order to figure out what the value of my AND is. So how would, what would the AND clauses be given the look structure that I just drew over there on the right? What would I write? How can I get these clauses? We're just going to do the cutter of the expression, which will return this, a list of our clauses, which is exactly what we want. We want a list of the clauses of our AND. So now that we have a predicate to test if we've got it, and we've got a selector to pull out what we want to operate on, we now need to write a val AND. So let's define a val AND. I'm just going to take an expression and an environment. Remember, everything needs to take an environment. We need to evaluate within some environment. So let's talk a little bit about how we want to do this. I've got some lists of clauses. So here are my AND clauses. What do I want to do? Let's just talk it through. See if the first one's true. And walk, and walk down the list. And as soon as we hear false, we return false. To get the end, we return true. So that expression is true. I'll evaluate the rest of the stuff. Then I check if this is true, I'm going to evaluate the rest. Otherwise, I'm going to return false. Because as soon as I hit one that's false, I stop. There's no point to finishing off. Once I hit one that's false, there's no way the expression can be true. So let's just bail out. So what I'd like to do is I'm going to define an internal procedure called iter. Guys, find where this is on the handout. This is on bottom four, so you can follow along. It's there. So we're going to iter on our list of clauses. Okay. So I'm cuttering down a list of clauses. If I'm cuttering down a list, what should I do first? Check for null. Check for null. So all right. If Null clauses, what should I return? Why? We made it all the way through the list. We didn't find anything false. We didn't necessarily find anything true. But we didn't necessarily find anything true. And that actually we'll talk about in a few minutes how to make this error correct. We're going to write it first, and we'll talk about how to error check for it. OK, so if we don't have any clauses, we got through the list. Otherwise. What should I do if I've got some sort of clause list? Well, what are we going to do over here? Check the first one. Okay. So how do I evaluate the first clause? Pass it to the evaluator. So I say if MC eval, we're going to evaluate the first clause car clauses, we need to pass MC eval one more thing, environment. environment. So we always need to evaluate with respect to some environment. In your, in your code here, you run yeah, you if you do it. Oh, did I write it? Did I write it backwards? This is actually the better way to write it. This is the way I wrote it in my notes. We can supersede the code there. Uh, this is probably clearer, because if, if this is true, then we're going to do something. Otherwise, we'll try first. It's exactly the same code. Would you prefer that I write it the way that's in the notes, or the way, this way? We just started talking about it this way, which is why I wrote it this way. Okay. I wrote it two different times. Okay. MC eval car clauses environment. 
If that is true, what do we want to do? Do I want to return true? Let's not hear from Chris for a minute. <laughs> All right, we want to do the next clause. We want to iterate, right? I'm going to iter on the cutter of the clauses. Otherwise, if this wasn't true, we want to return false. Okay. So now I need to make a call here. I can't just pass my expression because remember my expression is a tagged list. It's got the ADU and at the beginning of it. But conveniently enough, we wrote a selector called and clauses. So we're going to iter on the and clauses of the expression. Note that iter, since it's scoped inside a val and, we don't need to pass it the environment. It's already got that scoped within it. So then when we call that MC eval of the environment is scoped from this procedure here, we don't need to pass it into iter. It's just part of it. <laughs> thanks, thanks for running this. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that was the sub lecture. Sign language lecture, yes. So now we'll learn sign language. All right. So, do I need to write anything more to implement AND in my system? I've got to check for it in MC eval. Critical, because you wouldn't want to write all the code and then actually not check for it. I've got a way to figure out. If it actually is a tag list starting with ADU and, I've got a way to pull my clauses, and I've got a way to evaluate it. Do I need anything else? You need to check if the clauses are null at the start. We should check if the clauses are null at the start. See, in your average class, I wouldn't figure that out, and I could lead you happily through a bunch of stuff and then come back to that. But sure, let's error check. <laughs> so this is no error checking. Which means that... If we said ADU colon and, what would that be? Well, the clauses would be null, would go into iter, and would return true. So that's a little bit buggy, right? That's not a great that's construct. Hmm? That's our R4. Is that R4? Yeah. That's R4. We don't have to change it. But I want to change it because I want to talk about how we could error check. R4 doesn't need any. R4 doesn't they need any? Paren and paren is true. Well, because they were lazy. All right. That has no error checking. Let's actually write error checking. But it's okay. We don't have to be R4 compliant. Yeah, so right. So Todd had said that R4 says that that is true. That's page nine. I don't like that. I'm writing my own scheme. Therefore, we will do R4.2, and we will do what we want. So we're going to do some error checking. So this version is going to have error checking. So I raised off the line that called iter on the, cutter, on the um, and clauses. So here's my error checking. What do I want to do? We can do a cons or an if, but somehow actually what I'd like to do first is we're going to need to use and clauses potentially twice. Because if it's not null, then we're going to pass it. So let's use a let. I'm going to let the clauses be and clauses of the expression. Well, it would return nil. Because remember, it's at least going to be a list. At the very least, it's ADU and, and the cutter of that is nil. So it'll return the empty list. So we can call and clauses, which will be fine, and then check for the null here. So if null clauses, oh, what do I want to return? No, return false or an error. What would make more sense? Error, error. error would make more sense because we're being just as ambiguous if we say that 
this is false. And in fact, we're probably being even more ambiguous, right? That's kind of weird. It's one thing to say, okay, it's true. But if it's nothing, it makes it false. It would be much better to signal an error. But if what, huh? It's true. It's our language. We can do whatever we want. We can write it both ways. We could write error. We can write everything 50, 60 ways. Now, would we want to do, actually do an error and put them into the debugger, or could we maybe just have it display, do like list, no clauses, so that it doesn't put them into the debugger? Uh, the default, in, pretty much in the system, is to pop them into the debugger, okay. which pops them out of our system. It might be nicer to, you know, obviously what would be really nice is if we wrote a debugger inside MC of L, right. which of course you all can do for problem set nine, right? Oh, yeah. That's exercise three. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so you start throwing stuff at me. Nah. But we could write a debugger, our own sort of thing, and our debugger up in this level could just be returning a list. But I'm actually going to pop them out into the external one. Because that's where the debugger is. We don't have a debugger in our system. Otherwise, if we do have clauses, what do we do? I'm going to iterate on those clauses. OK. So this is one choice to error out. Another choice would to be go, to go with Rob's suggestion that if there's nothing, nothing was true, therefore it must be false, which we would just write pound false there. Yes? So basically what you want me to do is, if I don't have clauses, I'll have the define internal to the if. I don't think it looks as nice. I think it's kind of ugly, actually. I think it's... No, because you're still going to need to have a define and iter. You still need to define that. In. We don't have to have a let. We can make two. If null and clauses, then error. Otherwise, do the rest of it and iterate. Well, we'll still have to call. We'll still have to somehow get the and clauses again. All right. If we're going to need to iterate, we're somehow going to have to pull those out anyway. So we'll have to do it twice. So we can either use a let once, or we can do it twice. Where is this let going in at the bottom? So the let. So this is the internal iter procedure that's defined, and then here's the let. So that error checking line, is I just put that there so we could comment that that was what was happening, but normally we wouldn't have that. And we'd just be bumped up with that code. Okay. So it doesn't really matter in some sense whether we error out or we return false, or if we, even if we return true, as long as we specify what our language is going to do, just like R4 does. So we could have ADU scheme R1. And we're going to do these things. Would it be possible to give like a non fatal error and say, say no? Right, so this is what was suggested before. So we could also do <laughs> yet another choice <laughs> would be list no values. Right. This could make it cause have problems, right? Because if for some reason the and was a subclause, right? So we were saying if and blah 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 blah, and and returned a list of no values. We get into some weirdness, but we have this whole thing in Scheme where it's true because it's not false. So it's going to cause all sorts of weird things to happen. It's not going to be what we expect to be happening here. So this is probably not a good choice. Yeah. We can go with R4. We can return true. We cannot error check and just have it the way we wrote it before. Yeah. Um, for when it goes, gets sent to eval n, it mm -hmm. says the whole expression. But then, so won't the first thing you'd evaluate be the tag? No. Because right here we call and clauses here. But that was your error check. Well, before what we had is we were we had said iter and clauses. 
So that was the way it was before. Uh, we could have just as easily uh, right here. Yeah. If we had said and clauses expression, then over there we would just know that we were getting the clauses. Yeah. I, I don't want to continue the tangent too far. But no, that's fine. Tangent's like, good. Um, if you, maybe, maybe this was mentioned in another context. I'm not sure if we can this context, but uh, if you were anding ands, for example, if you had nested ands, mm -hmm. uh, and you were mixing those nested ands with other things that were true, um, those nested ands, if they returned false, would make the whole expression false. I don't know why you would have empty ands inside another and, but it would change the behavior. Sure. We're, I mean, we're, we are co totally changing the behavior here, right? So we're not using our for anymore. Right. So if we decide it's going to be false, then it changes the behavior. Right. Well, In some sense, we could claim that it's fairly degenerate to call and with no clauses. Oh, yeah. You know, why bother? And if they're going to, the heck with them. The language will blow up. <laughs> sure. I mean, it could be that some sort of dotted notation. Why would you need a nested ands at all? I mean, if any one of them is false, then they're all going to be false. So you can just string them out. John would like to say something. Either of those two conditions can happen if you're automatically generating code. Uh, if your scheme procedure is actually generating code that is to be evaluated, it's very easy to create conditions where you either have nested ands or um, generate ands without any arguments. But if you don't like to generate ands, the heck with them. <laughs> That's a design choice. Design choice. All you want to do if you want to do that or not. So let's follow an evaluation through. Uh, I probably shouldn't erase that. We, I didn't. I, I think. I think we pointed to it on the board, but we didn't actually do it. Or did you guys? Did you guys do it in recitation? No. We can look at if. I'm just wondering. Uh, here we were able to make the and special form because if it's already a special form. Ah, no, no. Which if is that? That's a scheme if, right? Right. Right. Which is special form. So that's what you're saying. We, we can do this because we've got the scheme up here. Okay. But we're not using the ADU if. Okay. So a val if looks like. So we can't define a special form without basing it on a scheme special form. Is that correct? Hmm? We can't. We don't have no, the power. No, we don't have the power to do that. No. I suppose we could do with well, but we're we're, we're we're using the if underneath, though. I mean, but we don't have to specify how it's. We'll, we'll do an, uh, an example in recitation where we'll generate a new special form. That's not based. That it's doesn't use based. another special form yeah. within it. Because you can do any arbitrary processing. Sure, we can do arbitrary processing. But I mean, here we're using if underneath. So the question was, are we defining and using if? That we are. So sometimes we, this special form is relying on an underlying special form. <laughs> we shouldn't talk about it now. It's, it's a subtle, I think it's a subtle issue. Okay. okay. Moving on. Let's evaluate something. Let's look at evaluating. Oh, goodness. Look, color. Can you guys read pink? Is this a good color? Huh? Yellow? Yes. Isn't yellow and white indistinguishable on the board? No? Okay. I'm going to do ADU and ADU equal 1, 3. ADU equal 1, 1. So if I type this in, oh, some parens would be nice probably. Whack. So if we have the proper parentheses, this will result in a call to MC eval on this clause.
in some environment. What environment are we in? The global environment, which is the global environment, which I would like to suggest that I may be able to abbreviate as TGE. Is this fine? <laughs> Please? <laughs> All right, so we're going to evaluate this in our metacircular evaluator. So if we look at our code for the metacircular evaluator, we're going to say, is this expression self-evaluating? Is it a number or a symbol? No. Is it a variable? No. Is it quoted? Does it have a quote tag on it? Does it have a defined tag on it? Does it have a set bang tag? We did this in reverse order. Is it an if? No. Is it an and? Yay. So I'm going to call the val and on what? My expression. Uh, well, I sort of wo I waved my hand over. Yeah. This is a call to MC of L, and I didn't write out all the con self evaluating variable quoted. Right, but it's none of these things, and we drop down to MC apply. No, and it's not none of these apply. things. It's and question mark. So don't we pass in the whole list first, and then we have to parse it individually? We are in passing the in the whole list, and what and question mark asks is if it's a tagged list starting oh, with ADU right. and. Because it's, it's, it's a special form. Right. Right, OK. So there's our clause, our expression that we're passing, and we're going to pass the environment. Hi, quick question. How does it go from the very first step to the second step? I know we usually do control XE, but mm -hmm. would that that's when we start the evaluation. So basically, the driver loop is waiting to read in an expression. When the expression is read in, it calls it using MC of L. We can actually see the driver loop. It's on probably the last page of the handout or the second to last page. Right here. So if you look at the driver, driver loop, second, uh, third procedure down on page 10, it prompts for the input with the input prompt, and then it lets the input be the result of reading, and lets the output be the result of MC eval of the input in the global environment. So the driver loop has taken care of this for us. All right, so that's being done by the driver loop. That's how we jumped to that next step. Can you somehow find driver loop to control XE or something? Like that? So, that so basically, when the read is what, basically, when we're doing the read, we're waiting for the control XE to be like the end character saying, we're done typing in our stuff, read this current expression I just typed to you. That's what's happening there. Other questions? Excuse me. Ah. <laughs> How does what? Input prompt. <laughs> input prompt? If, uh, input prompt is on the code that I just handed to Alex. <laughs> Which will not be available for a few seconds. Which, yeah. <laughs> if I could read it backwards, it Forty. says define. <laughs> <laughs> input prompt is merely a string, if you notice, looking backwards through the paper. And today's sponsor is Tide. <laughs> <laughs> and here's Holly up close and personal. Yay. Everybody at home loves me. You like me, I know. Oh, you really. Anyways, input prompt is merely a string so that we prompt for input. And prompt for input is just using a string there. So we could have put a different, we could have actually just put the string right there. But what this allows, with this little bit of an abstraction, we could change the input prompt if we wanted to very easily without having to go into the driver loop to change anything. Check. OK. Back to our evaluation. So here we are. We called the val and with our expression and our environment. So we go into val and, which would be, oh, heck, I have the code on the board. There you go. Here's a val and. I'm going to let my clauses, ah, it's much easier evaluating with the old one. 
I'm going to let my clauses be the result of calling and clauses on the expression. Would you guys mind if we sort of skipped over writing out all the let stuff and just say clauses will now be? Yeah. Okay. Clauses will now be the list of those two elements. <coughs> and it's not null, so we don't produce an error. And we call iter on those clauses. <coughs> so we iter on the list. ADU equal 1, 3. ADU equal 1, 1. Do I need to pass the environment? No. It's scoped. Okay, we're now in a frame when we are evaluating about and in which the global environment, we env env is bound to the global environment. And John today in Restation is going to go through the chaining and creating of environments, show you guys how they're built up and how the lists are built up. So we'll talk about environments for station today. So I'm going to iter on this. Here's my iter code. Takes the clauses. I check if null clauses. Well, is this null? No. So I need to go if MC eval car clauses when do something. So let me write if MC eval car of my clauses. What's the car of my clauses? ADU equal 1, 3. And now, because I'm calling MC eval and I'm not going to be scoped within iter anymore, and because MC eval requires this, we pass the environment. So then I've got some more code here. We need to figure this out. Remember, because if is a special form and scheme, right? We're in the underlying scheme now. We're in white land, not yellow land. So if the special form and scheme says that we're going to check the predicate before we do anything with the consequent or the alternative. So let's evaluate MC eval on ADU equal 1, 3 in the global environment. So we go to MC eval. Well, is that self-evaluating? No. Is it a variable? No. Not quoted, not an assignment, blah, blah, blah. We fall all the way down to it being an application. Okay, it's not any of our special forms, and it's not a single element like a variable or a number or a symbol. So we're going to call MC apply, thus spinning off our eval apply cycle. Okay. On MC eval, the operator of the expression, which is the car. In the environment, so we're going to MC apply that to list of values, the operands, which is the cutter or the list one three in the global environment. Questions so far? Yeah. So what is the expression that we have It says list of values. And then we have to call the operands of the expression, which is the cutter. I said a line up, but before that. This here? Um, no, the same line for you, but in the code. It says MC apply, MC eval, current operator expression. Yep, so this is the MC apply. Okay. MC eval. The operator is the car of the expression. And what's the expression? The expression was this. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Because we had called, we called MC eval on this expression with the global environment. And then because it was an application, we fell through everything else, all the other checks, and we are MC applying the result of the MC evaluating this operator in the global environment and then evaluating the operands in the global environment. Now, was our ADU equal? Is that a primitive procedure? That will be a primitive procedure that we've defined. So um, if you look on page probably like 9, I would guess. Page 9, about halfway down, we define a bunch of primitive procedures. 
sorry. Okay, so find a bunch of primitive procedures on page nine, about halfway down. Okay, so there are the primitive procedures for all of you at home. Okay, so MC apply. We need to figure out what the MC eval of ADU equal is, and we need to figure out the list of values one three. So let's take care of MC apply on ADU equal. Is that self-evaluating? But it is a variable. So we're going to look up its value. When we look up its value, because it's a primitive and it's been bound, ADU equal to be the primitive scheme, it's going to return the scheme equal, which I will put in a box to signify that we've actually evaluated that. <coughs> So here's scheme equal, and now we need to do list of values 1, 3. List of values is at the bottom of page 1. <coughs> I don't want to give up page 1. Did somebody get Alex a handout? <laughs> and it says, if there are no operands, which is looking to see if the expressions are null, which is not true, we're going to I'll take the evaluation out here so I need the more, more space. Cons. The MC eval of the first operand, which is the car, which is one in the global environment, two, the list of values on the rest, which is the cutter, which is the list three in the global environment. So this will be cons MC eval 1 in the global environment, which is finally, thank goodness, self-evaluating, which means we just return itself. It's a number. We return the number, which means now we have 1, which has been evaluated in the scheme. Then we have to do the list of values of the list 3. Well, the list three is not null, so we call, so it's cons MC eval on the car three in the global environment. We cons that to a call to list of values. Oh, it loves me. Um, with the result of the cutter, null in the global environment. Okay, so this is still cons 1, and then we're going to cons MC of L 3 in the global environment, which is just 3. What Symbols. 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 And then the list of values of null will return nil. This. When we build this back up, we get the list of 1 and 3. We've got an equal, and we're calling MC apply on that. So now we need to evaluate MC apply with equal on 1 and 3. On page 1 is MC apply. And the first thing we check to say, is it a primitive procedure? Thankfully, it is. So if it is a primitive procedure, we're going to apply the primitive procedure. And apply a primitive procedure is probably on some page I have now given away, which is unfortunate. I believe it probably was on page 9. Yes? And apply a primitive procedure. Oh, here, let me just write that. We're going to apply a primitive procedure. of the procedure with the arguments. Why am I not passing any environment? It's all, it's all been evaluated. I didn't pass any, no environment here, 
and no environment here. Because when we get to apply, we've already evaluated everything. Remember the rule for evaluating expression? Evaluate all the sub-expressions of our compound expression and then apply the first to the rest. We've done all the evaluations before we get to the apply. Which is why apply does not need to take an environment because everything's already been evaluated in its environment. Cool? Sort of? Maybe? Okay, so apply for your procedure turns out to be apply an underlying scheme. So we're going to apply equal to the list 1, 3. By now, you guys are familiar with apply. Apply takes a procedure and a list of arguments, effectively breaking up that list of arguments for us. We're going to check to see if 1 and 3 are equal to one another, which is going to return. True. False. <laughs> <laughs> like, whoa, alternate universe, man. <laughs> Because we want this to be false, because if it were true, it would mean we would spiral off into evaluating the next one. But fortunately, it's not. Which means this false is a result of when we evaluated this. So now we have if false. So we are not iterating. We bounce out and return false. And then the driver loop will take care of printing that for us. Speaking of driver loop, actually, yesterday when we were running, the question was, we were calling MC eval loop. To start things running. MC eval loop creates the new global environment for us. If you guys bounce out because of some bug, you get into the debugger, you can resume by executing driver loop. So this starts with a new with a new global environment, and this resumes with whatever is the global environment, whatever is in the global environment. So if you guys are halfway through your assignment and you've evaluated lots and lots of stuff inside the Metacircular Evaluator, you hit a bug because you put in your new OR and you made a mistake in one of the arguments, you can resume to get back where you were by doing driver loop. But you should use this to start up first, because yeah, you need to create the global environment. And you should also use that if, for some reason, you want a fresh start. Let's say you've been playing with it, you've done lots of stuff, and you just want to get rid of it all. Then you can reevaluate MC eval loop, and that will clean out the global environment for you. I assume that if we kill scheme entirely and then come back in. If you kill scheme entirely, it's gone. Yeah. And hopefully, you guys won't need to kill scheme entirely, but it could happen. And if you do have to kill scheme entirely, you lose it. The global environment's gone. Well, this variable for the global environment's gone. It'll create a new one when we restart. And that's actually mentioned in the problem set, too. But that's how you do it. Yep. What about how you got the equal from the ABU equal? Because it doesn't equal any of the things. And then where did it go to first? So this here, when I go into MC eval, Variable question mark is going to be true. Oh, because it's been predefined. Already. Right. And it was predefined as a primitive procedure when we created the global environment. When the global environment's created, anything that we have in our list of primitive procedures will be put into the global environment for us. So it's a variable. We look it up and we see that it was bound to be schemes primitive equal. Okay. Yes? Mm -hmm. And uh, we tripped on, you said it's application. The code, the code includes a, um, a question mark expression uh, test. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, so if false. So we were looking at this version of the val and rather than the one that was on the paper. We wrote a different one on the board, so I was using the one on the board. Other questions? On the back of this last page, there are these two defines, unphraser list depth limits and unphraser list breadth limit. Unparser. Un oh, yeah, okay, whatever. Uh, uh, what are those? Because they're not used anywhere. Are those, those effects? Those internal? are going to be internals for scheme. Okay. Um, 
and we are defining those. It actually is explained slightly, a little bit in the problem set. Uh, and it's basically going to prevent us from printing any circular list to too many levels. It's going to keep us going to infinite loops because with our environments we're creating, we might set up some circular lists. It's going to prevent us from printing that out to too many levels. That's explaining the problem set. This is just about the couple of last lines on the last page of the handout. Unparser depth level, unparser blah, blah, blah level. Uh, this is just going to prevent us from printing out circular lists to too many levels and keeping us from blowing up. Because the environment will be a circular list. If you try to look at it, it might be a circular list. If we try to look at it, we don't get into problems. Okay. So let's look at some more changes. Do you guys have any more questions on AND? When you're asked to write OR, think about how we wrote AND. It's going to be kind of similar. Sort of similar there. All righty. What I want to do is make some more changes to the language. Because we're an ADU scheme, let's make some changes. Right now, we've pretty much been simulating scheme, except for this weirdness that we did with the empty AND. We've been pretty much going straight along with writing a language that's exactly like scheme. But what if, because I continually spell lambda wrong on the board, for some reason skipping a letter, I, instead of saying lambda x times x x, I want to say, what am I hearing? Bob. Bob. Okay, we could do Bob. It would be shorter. Bob. I was going to say make procedure, but hey. That's so conventional, you know. I'll go with Bob. Okay. <laughs> no, not Microsoft. Then it's Bob is going away. How about George? I like George better. Microsoft didn't co op George, did they? No, they didn't get Bob either. When I did my nerd kit way back when, 6004, which is the equivalent of the class that you guys will have on, um, on the machines, but you guys won't have the nerd kit. So you said these suitcases you'd have to carry around to do all the wiring in it, and they called it the nerd kit. I named mine George. Anyways, too much information, I suppose. Okay. <laughs> so, how do I make this change? Instead of lambda, I want to use George in my system. Where would I need to make changes? Changes to MC Val. I would claim that perhaps we don't even need to change that. Uh, I hear define primitive procedures. We need to change. I could just change lambda question mark mm -hmm. to check for a tagged list that started with George. Yeah. Might be a little confusing because we're saying lambda question mark, George. Uh, yeah. But we could do that. So right now, lambda is defined as follows define lambda of an expression to be. Tagged list expression in our sheet. It's ADU lambda. We can just go and write George or ADU George, whichever we would prefer. But if it were George, then it actually had a data structure with George as the student that would cause problems. We'll ultimately evaluate George even in the model. Yeah. Well, actually, this is something else that comes out on the assignment, uh, which actually talks about what happens if we're trying to redefine reserve words. And as it stands, we can. But you will make changes that will prevent that from happening. Um, but this is ADU George. If we had a student, the student probably wouldn't be called ADU George. <laughs> we could easily have a student, I suppose, called Lambda, too. <laughs> but if we quoted it, then it would be OK anyway, so it wouldn't be evaluated. <coughs> So we need to change that. I'd like to claim that there's one other thing that we need to change. Anybody have a thought? If we look at page something or other for the Lambda stuff, uh, four, I'm hearing four. There we go, top of page four. We change Lambda expression to AU George. Do I need to change Lambda parameters? No. Lambda body. Make Lambda needs to change. So currently, make lambda is defined as follows. Define 
make lambda on the parameters in the body, cons, quote, ADU lambda to the parameter and to the cons of the parameter in the body. So here we would need to change ADU lambda to ADU George. Thus ends the change. That's it. Two places. Now, we could argue that perhaps it would actually be nicer if we called this George question mark. Because if we're going to change it. Hmm? Isn't, uh, I thought the idea behind lambda question mark is that we're saying that's returning whatever defines a procedure, not the word lambda. So that if we're now saying George defines a procedure, lambda question mark will return then the question mark is saying, is this, ex is this expression a procedure? Mm -hmm. Is so this a lambda expression? Mm -hmm. George is now our lambda expression. Right. So All I did was basically do a string replace. Right. But if you renamed it George, you're no longer saying. Well, it's we're just saying that George is lambda now. Yeah. It's a George procedure. It's a George thing. Lambda. George is now lambda. But doesn't that sort of violate the logic of the MC eval, the top level MC eval loop, being all the generic operators your language could have? Well, this is an operator. This is a special form. In my, in my language, George is now a special form. I mean, I agree it, it works. I mean, but, okay. Question is, but why? Because uh, <laughs> we can. Well, it just seems, it seems like the point of the top level MC of our loop is it's the most generic, so that any language, in, you know, sort of in the theor theoretical world could plug into the MC of our loop. However you define if, if question mark will go off and tell you if this is an if statement in our Swahili programming language. Okay, so yes, MC eval actually doesn't really, MC eval doesn't need to change. We could, might change our tagging here. We actually have a syntax file, right? And that's what we're changing. There's a syntax. Syntax stuff starts on page three and goes on. That's all basically defines the syntax of our language. Right. Um, and we did, all we made changes to to make Lambda be George was make changes to the syntax file. Right. But what I was saying here is that in some sense, if we're now calling Lambda George in our language, it's a George procedure. It's a George now. It's not a lambda. So maybe we should check George question mark instead of lambda question mark. It's not necessary. It's merely a string replace. All we would do is replace anywhere that lambda appeared in a question mark or lambda, whatever it is, lambda parameters, lambda body with George parameters, George body, George question mark, make George. Changes absolutely nothing. Yeah. So the, the question actually relates to, I think, if I understand it, relates to. Uh, Syntax versus semantics, uh, which is a well, well studied issue. The syntax that we're changing is merely to replace lambda with George. And when we use lambda question mark or George question mark, we are merely checking the syntax. We're only looking for the tag of the expression. We don't know what the expression does when we're checking for the tag. It's what we do when we find the, that, that particular tag that defines the semantics. So we can put any tag, any arbitrary tag, it changes the syntax, but it doesn't change the meaning of that expression. And when we say lambda question mark in MC eval, when we're actually looking for that tag, that doesn't carry any meaning. What carries the meaning is what we do once we find the tag. Okay. So we're not actually saying, when we say lambda of, of an expression, we're not saying this is in the syntax, we're not saying this is something that produces an expression. That's part of the semantics. I'm sorry, that produces right. a procedure. That's part of the semantics. Yes. If you wanted to add a new thing, like a ray that is not in scheme, you would put it in this MC evaluate dispatch section, wouldn't you? You'd have sure. to check for a ray. Right. If you, so you want to add a new command array? Yeah. So you'd, that would have to be in the dispatch. You would have to put that in dispatch, right? Something, right? You'd be still. It's basically any special forms. In your new language. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So what we don't need to check for is if it's a primitive, because it'll just be bound in our global environment. We'll look it up and we'll apply it. And we don't need to put any checks for any procedures that we're writing. But any special forms that we're going to have, we do. Um, and array, we could actually just bind to maybe be list or something, or maybe we would create some new data structure and do it that way. Sure. 
But if we're going to do any sort of special evaluation, we should have a special check for it in MC of L. So, but I mean, we could write, rather than have it be within MC of L, you might want to write, we could write an, an array procedure on top of our evaluator, basically at the evaluator level when you get the MC of L prompt. Here we could define some procedure array that takes in some args, which would be nice if I had more space here. If and then want, return the args. If we wanted a new language to have a fundamental data structure, okay, this is not the way to do it if you want it to be in your language. Uh, we want to put it down in the MC of L, yeah. But this is one way we could do it and run on top of it to see if it would actually work if you like what it's doing. You can run at the top level. Yeah, yeah. Well, if you want to make it, actually, what we could do is, if all you want is array to be list, in your prim procs, you could make a primitive procedure called ADU array. Do I have my primitive procedure sheet? No, I think I lost that one. That's on page nine, right? I lost nine. Give me page nine. Thank you. So we define prim procs, primitive procedures, as a list of a bunch of lists. So we could make one list, ADU array, that goes to list. So we could define as a primitive procedure, if all we wanted array to do, be was a list, then we could just bind it right there. And then we wouldn't actually need to change something. If we were going to do something special on it, special evaluations, like a two-dimensional array. then you might want to actually make it a special form, depending on how you were doing it. Other questions? Uh, uh, an ADU apply. If we were to define an ADU apply, mm -hmm. would we just map it to, to MC apply? Or, or is there actually, like, is, is Yeah, I, I, if you were defining apply on the on top of MC eval, I would map it to the MC apply. You wouldn't want to map down into yeah. scheme, because then you're losing a level. We never want to jump two levels. So if you guys are writing stuff at the MC eval prompt, you do not want to try to access anything that's in scheme that hasn't been brought through the MetaCircular Evaluator. So if there's a primitive that you want that I haven't given you, you need to add it to the list of these primitive procedures, and then you need to evaluate this, and you need to restart to get it into the global environment. Okay. So if you find that I just haven't given you a big enough list for what you guys want to be doing, because I've only given you plus, times, divide, subtract, a few list operators, and a couple of checks equals greater than less than. If you want more of the scheme primitives coming through, you would need to add them there. So when you say we need to restart, we need to actually get out of MC eval and rerun the uh, MC eval MC eval loop, yep. Because if you don't, it won't restart the global environment. Because it's when we first create the global environment that these primitive procedures are read into the global environment for us. And if you don't restart that loop, if you don't reset the global environment, even though you've evaluated prim procs, nothing's gotten pulled into the global environment for us. Now, this is just a list that when we go to evaluate the global environment, actually, which is probably on page 9 or 10. Bottom of page 10, we say define the global environment to be setup environment. And then if we could find setup environment, which is probably on page 9. Here we go, page 9, halfway down, setup environment. We let the initial environment be the result of extending the environment with the primitive procedure names and the primitive procedure objects on the empty environment. So the first thing that we do when we're creating an initial environment is we put all the primitives in. And the environment, how we create environments, is going to be something that John's going to cover today in recitation. We're going to talk a lot about that. And then we put two more things in, true and false, and then we return that environment. So the global, when we first start up, is going to have all of our primitives and true and false. That's what the global environment is going to hold until we start doing bindings. So when we re resume a global environment and we clean it up, that's all that will be there when we start again, when we do the MC of our loop. Yes? No, sorry. Yeah. So to start everything up, to get into this ADU world, you do 
No, we don't do setup environment. We're going to do, you're going to evaluate MC, the application of MC dash eval dash loop. Okay, which will call, which will do it. Which will do it for us. So once we're in this world, the reason why it's so important with the primitives is if we did square without ADU colon space, it wouldn't know what to do. Actually, nothing in our language needs to be prefaced with ADU colon. We're doing ADU colon because it makes it easier to see which is where. But we don't actually have to have anything in our language that has ADU colon in front of it. What you'll notice in the book is they put, obviously they wouldn't put ADU colon, but they don't put anything in front of it. They're writing scheme in scheme. We're effectively writing scheme, but we're using these ADU colon tags to help us try to differentiate when we're in the MC evaluator level, when we're typing into the end of circular evaluator, and when we're using underlying scheme. That's the reason for putting the ADU colon tag on everything. It's just to try to help us see the difference. But if you had square, would it go at variable? Would it be called at variable, or would it be called, where, where would that happen? The answer is yes. Where could square go? Well, there's two things that we could do. One is that we could add square as a primitive procedure and try to get the underlying from scheme. So we could add list ADU square, square. And that would pull square from underlying scheme. Or we could just define it when we're at the MC eval prompt. And we can do an ADU define ADU square. I'm going to tag everything, even the variable names. ADU times, ADU x, ADU x. So we could define square at our MC of L prompt. But when we quit out of our current state and we restart, it won't be there. If we did it as a primitive up here, every time we resumed, it would be in the global environment. What I'm wondering is if you did neither. If you do neither, you don't have it. Well, say square was a primitive. I don't know if square is a primitive. It's not, right? Or say we didn't define ADU plus, and then we used plus. Where would it, what would happen? Something that exists in scheme, but yeah, Right. So if plus exists in scheme, but we haven't sucked it up, right. not going to work. It's not going to find it. When it looks up the variable name, it's not going to find it. That's right. Because you can think of it as, basically, scheme has its big global environment. But within that global environment, we've created a variable called the global environment, which is going to have only in it what we've put in it. And if we don't put something in it, if we forgot to put plus in, then it's not going to work. We're not going to be able to get through. We cannot jump from the top level, the levels yesterday were 1, 2, and 3. We can't get from level 1, MC of L, to level 3, scheme. It needs to be mitigated through level 2 for us. What causes that break? Because that up to this point, when we were drawing environment diagrams and whatnot, every time we spawned a procedure or spawned an environment out of a procedure, it looked back to the environment that that procedure was defined in. So it seems like this, we would have a frame spawned by like, the MC eval that would point back up to, that might, that might have produce a global environment, but that would also point back up to. Because what's going to happen is, and you'll see this in recitation more, when we've got environments, if we have chains of environments, we'll have E2 that's changed to E1 that's changed to the global environment. The global environment here is not Scheme's global environment, but the list of the global environment that we created and might have made changes to. But because what we're effectively doing is we're representing the environment as a list. And if we reach the end of that list, it's not like we can go from that list to bouncing out into Scheme. So everything that we've defined is in a list representing our environment. And we can't get from our global environment in Metas Metacircular Evaluator to schemes. Effectively, we're running in schemes, so obviously making changes in the global environment. But the environment, when we evaluate something, when we do an MC eval, the base, the last thing we look at is the dash global dash environment, which is a list. We hit the end of that list, and it's not there. It's unbound, even though it might have been defined in Schemes global environment. Okay. Does, does the real global environment or the real environment model work just like ours in that link what we what we've been drawing and thinking of as a link environments are actually just one big table where we stick we add stuff on so lists. 
okay, lists. Environment frames or lists, yeah. We add yeah. stuff on. They're not really separate environments that are linked magically. They're, they're, they're lists of lists. Of lists. I mean, we well, everywhere we are, we have an environment, and we have these pointers to follow up, and we're basically following these list pointer type of things from the box of pointer diagrams, the okay. lists. One more example. Wait, I have a question. Okay. See? See? You guys have learned. Oh, no. <laughs> Don't want to do it anymore. Yes. <laughs> Must find it for the next three hours. I'll come back. Uh, <laughs> Oh, first of all, can, we can assign primitives that aren't scheme primitives, right? Like we could write our own. If say square didn't exist in scheme, or say we wanted to write cube, or I don't know if that, that might exist in a scheme primitive as well, but in any case, we can add something to the primitive list where we actually write the lambda there. Yes. And then that will be like a <coughs> scheme right. primitive. This is underlying scheme. This is lambda. Can't be George. We're in underlying scheme now. Yes? Is that necessary? Is what necessary? Could you write a, a define a primitive in terms of Never mind. Well, well here, the primitive the procedures here, when we're defining the global environment, we're evaluating this stuff. We're in scheme. Yeah, we're not running through MC of L at that point. So it's got to be with lambda. Um, are we getting a problem? Yes, we are. Okay, and, um, are we close to getting a problem set today? Okay. John will finish rereading the problem set, and it will go out within the next hour, hopefully. Okay, and um, in terms of uh, commenting code and that sort of thing, I don't know how much that's been addressed in the early bridge assignment, because it seems as if we are expected to reasonably comment our code. I've had a little bit of trouble commenting code within a function. Um, in terms of the interpreter just not being happy yeah. with that. Yeah, that's if your comments have parens in them, the interpreter can be unhappy with it okay. for some reason. It shouldn't be, but it is. Mm, I've just had given trouble just putting a semicolon in a comment and it's just it's Barfing. giving me error, like trying to think of that as a unknown variable. Uh, there, there has been a little bit of weirdness. Okay. I've had some no parentheses on the last one. Yeah, okay. I've, huh. I've had some uh, multi-line comments for whatever reason, it seemed to it seemed to be some issues, and there may be something else in there that it's that it's finding. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think they actually, I, I've seen a problem. Actually, somebody had asked me a question once. Actually, I think I might have been Todd I went and worked with once. And if the comments fall within the code, sometimes they cause problems, and it's really funky. You can comment outside of the code before okay. it or something. Yeah. So you don't really we, care about inline comments? We haven't been really talking about inline comments that much. And, so I mean, if you want to put, it would be nice before functions that you're turning in, especially if we say, you know, extend uh, the Metacircle Evaluator in some way and tell us what you did to describe. It would be nice in your comments to say, I did this and this and this. It's going to work this way. Right. Um, but if inline comments are giving you a problem, I wouldn't worry about them. Okay. Yes? Um, back to that uh, where, where you said that if we were going to add any additional primitive procedures, that we would have to get out of the uh, ADU scheme and then get back into it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was just kind of glancing over here. Would it work to just run extend environment, primitive procedures names, primitive procedures object, and instead of the empty environment, do the global environment? Would, would yes, except then you're double, divine, double defining some of your primitives. So your list is going to have two pluses in it, which will work fine, okay. but it's weird. Okay. I would clean the global environment up. I would just clean it up, restart, redo it. Other question? Clarify something about mm -hmm. the variable lists mm -hmm. in, the, in the environments. Mm -hmm. the, they're a list of pairs, right? Names, no. Value. Okay, what are they? In, in what it's going to be two lists. Did you guys do those lists of pairs? It's a, in the small evaluators, it's a list of pairs. Eh, not well, in this evaluator. Small list in any case. It's going to be a list. It's two lists. A list of two lists, where the first one has the variables in it, and the second one has the bindings. Oh, and they're just matched up. Yeah. Okay, so when we extend it, there's no nesting going on, right? We're just, we're just continuing right. it on. You're just continuing that list. Now, if we're creating a new environment that's pointing to it, then we're starting to get some nesting. Is that? Well, our new frame will be part of the, glo the list. Basically, our list will be added. There'll be a frame put at the beginning. There. But it's the same level. Okay. Huh? Yeah, it's all going to be the same level. It's going to be one level list where the start of it, 
So if we have this big list like blah, 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 at the end of the list is going to be the global environment stuff. And then if for some reason we created some E1 stuff, that'll be up here. Let's, let's let John draw it all out in recitation so we're running out of time now. You'll just have to wait a mere hour and a half. <laughs> well, but, but, and this helps explain why we can't get back to the global environment stuff. Right, right. We're only in a list, right? We've got this list stuff, and if we don't find it in that list, we're not going to find it. We don't bounce out into screen. <coughs> Other questions? Yeah. 